PFT PM Posse. Do you think the NFL's oligarchs could have slipped one by the union and essentially planted Howell as executive director since he seems to be more management than union? I don't think this was a Manchurian candidate situation. One of the things the NFL PA was trying very hard to do was make sure the league didn't know who the finalists were, so the league couldn't put a thumb on the scale. Now, did the league know? Did owners know? Did the commissioner know that Lloyd Howell was one of the finalists? I don't know. I don't think this was that. I know the NFL PA was very concerned about that. PFTP and Posse, we are headed to a Willie Nelson concert tonight. And as you know, I'll have plenty of Chris Sims' favorite plant with me. Best concert you've been to. Any advice, legal or otherwise, as we go to Willie in Dallas? I don't have any advice. I mean, I, I, I didn't know Willie Nelson was still touring. I'd say Willie Nelson is, and this is an example of someone who is still contributing to society on the wrong side of 80, something I aspire to do. And I've done the math. It's not that far off. It's 22 years away. Holy crap, that's depressing. But what can we do? As I've said before, we all got one ride. We all got one life. And we all live every year of that life. And our challenge is to get the absolute most out of the time we have. Man, that sounds so. I should be on a soapbox when I say that. All right, I have no advice for you. And the best concert I've ever been to, probably when I saw Kiss in 1996, when they got back together again, put the makeup back on with the original four members, that concert was, to me, the equivalent of stepping into a time machine and going back 20 years. That, that's what it felt like. And I've seen them several times since then, and it doesn't feel like that anymore. But at least in 1996, they still, with their makeup and their gear on, they looked like they did in the late 70s. That, that was the best one, because that was just a return of something I never thought would ever happen again and a true feeling of rewinding the clock back by a couple of decades. One more. Well, you know what? I'm going to move on to others. PFT, PM Posse, you get too many because you're at the top of the stack because I follow that account. Will Shaman. Could, would a running back clause be created in rookie contracts that activates after a back second year and allows them to negotiate their second contract activated by performance? For example, if you have 2,000 yard rushing in two years, you're eligible for an extension after two years. It's all something that would have to be collectively bargained because currently the way the rules are, you've got to have three years in as a drafted player to be able to renegotiate your contract. As an undrafted player, you got two years, but after two years, you've You've got no ability to become a free agent. You're an exclusive rights free agent, which is a fancy way of saying you're not a free agent. Your choices are re-sign with your current team, typically the exclusive rights tender, the one-year minimum salary, or don't play. So it would all have to be solved through CBA negotiations. And that's what any solution that we could come up with, and I appreciate that, fa that, that folks are coming up with ideas, but... Any solution would have to be bargained by the league and the union. Jeremy Dodd, if you had a crystal ball, how do you see the next CBA negotiations going? I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I have no idea. I have no idea what the union's objectives will be. I have no idea how Lloyd Howell is going to lead the union. I have no idea if he's even going to be the executive director the next time around. I don't know who the next commissioner will be. Presumably, Roger Goodell won't be the commissioner when these next CBA negotiations happen. So... I can't even begin to speculate on what will happen with the next CBA negotiations. Andrew Skur, I realize it's not a solution to the entire problem, but do teams restrict access to gambling sites from their Wi-Fi networks within their own facilities? I don't know how it works when you've got an app. I don't know. I'd like to think they do, but you're right. It doesn't even begin to solve the problems. And the easiest way to solve the problem is make sure the players understand exactly what the rules are and comply with them. Valorian 12, what do you think happens first? Saudi Arabia is able to purchase an NFL team or Saudi Arabia starts its own American football league? Well, you need to know what they want to do. Where do they want to throw their money next? And if the NFL finds out that Saudi Arabian interests want to use some of that public investment fund money to buy an NFL team, they need to ask themselves, what happens if we say no? What happens if... We shut them out. Would they create their own league? Would they compete with us for players? Would they 
play their games in football season on Saturdays when we can't via the broadcast antitrust exemption? Would they play on Sundays? Would they get better players? Would they spend more money than we spent? Is it better to partner with them than to compete with them? It all depends on what they want to do. But if they ever come sniffing around to buy a team, <clears throat> the league needs to think about what happens if they say no. And I've thought for years now, there was an article in Sports Illustrated about football in America. And one of the things I detected, it was a very long article and I read most of it, I think. One of the things I detected is there's an appetite for football the way it used to be played. At least there was at the time. And I've wondered whether or not someone would create a football league that embraced the rules of the 80s and the 90s. Old school football. Rough and tumble. Brutal. All the players know the risks. Everybody signs a waiver. You know you may get concussions. Morally, it's problematic. But you know what? If you can appeal to 30% of the audience, of the population, who would turn their back on the NFL as maybe too woke. And they'd go back and watch old school football where it's basically gladiators. There's an opportunity there. If someone wants to do it, if they have the money, and we know the public investment fund definitely does. Roxanne, why doesn't the NFL use the 17th game as a neutral site game? Some of those massive college stadiums around the country could be utilized. There's a lot of potential and a football hungry base in all these locations. I'm sure money is the answer, but it'd be a cool vibe if they did this. I, I said this from the moment they went to 17 games. It creates 16 neutral site games every year. Now we see a certain number of them being played in Europe and elsewhere, but the rest of them, it could be every team because right now what happens is Every team in one conference plays nine home games. Every team in the other conference plays eight home games. And typically, teams from the conference that play nine home games give up one of their home games. The Jaguars give up a home game no matter whether or not they have nine or eight. But for the neutral site games in other countries, it comes from, and I think this year it's going to be AFC teams. And it goes back and forth. Well, why not have everyone give up a home game from both conferences? There's a neutral site for every team. What would have been that ninth home game is a neutral site game. And I've suggested the University of Michigan Stadium, Notre Dame, Penn State, Texas, some of the massive college stadiums. Here's the problem. You'd have to equip the stadiums with the real-time communication cables to 345 Park Avenue. Is it worth it for one game a year? I don't know. And then you get into the question of, and I think Michigan is currently taking this up, alcohol sales at college sport, sporting events. I remember back in 1998 when the Steelers and the Falcons played a preseason game in Morgantown. And I think Morgantown was being scouted as a potential alternate location for Pittsburgh Steelers home games while they built Heinz Field, depending upon whether there was a way to build the new stadium without also preventing Three River Stadium from being utilized. What they ended up doing was building them right next to each other. But there was an issue about alcohol sales for that game. So that's part of it as well. So I think it'd be a great idea, but alcohol sales and the presence of the appropriate technology to allow for real-time replay review, that would be one of the challenges if the NFL would ever want to do it. I think they should. I agree. It's a great question. A great point. David Mitchell, what are the criteria for in-season hard knocks? We know the criteria for preseason hard knocks. I don't know. Now, for preseason hard knocks, you are exempt if you have a new head coach, if you've been to the playoffs in either the last two seasons, or if you've done it in the last 10 years. For in-season, I think it's still too new. I think they're having an easy enough time finding volunteers to do it that they don't have to have criteria where they could tap someone on the shoulder and say, you have to do it. And I know they're in the process now as they look for a hard knocks team, they're trying to find an in-season team and the commanders are a candidate I'm told for, for either one, not both, although both would be kind of interesting, but they're a candidate for either one. They want to get this sale finalized. The vote is tentatively set for July 20. 
They want to get the sale finalized before they pick the commanders for anything. And at at our last word, what we had heard earlier this week, the Jets bracing for an involuntary assignment to be the Hard Knocks team for the preseason. Not that they've been picked, not that they've been told, not that it's been reported or announced or anything like that. They're bracing for it. They fear that it's going to happen. We'll see if it does. Sam Eichenlob, hypothetical question. What are the chances the NFL ever comes back to St. Louis with an expansion team? Or did St. Louis ruin their best shot by taking the $800 million settlement in the lawsuit against the NFL? Yeah, there are hard feelings right now between the league and St. Louis. But what will happen is eventually there'll be enough of a change in leadership of the league. There'll be enough of a change in political leadership in St. Louis and Missouri to allow maybe the page to be turned. Because look, the NFL is always looking for that other city out there that is willing to give a bunch of taxpayer money to build a stadium as the leverage against a team's inability to get taxpayer money in its own stadium. I thought this would be a bigger story this week. The acknowledgement from Erie County Executive Mark Cars that it was a given. If they didn't get taxpayer money for the new Bills stadium, the Bills were moving. And maybe it's obvious. I don't think it's obvious to most fans. I think most fans don't want to think of it that way. But if you've got a team that's due for a new stadium or a massive renovation like in Jacksonville right now, and you're not going to kick in taxpayer money, either any or enough, you run the risk of that team going somewhere where they will kick in the money. So St. Louis could be a candidate. It could be a place that serves as the leverage for a couple of other cities before it gets a team at some point, or if there's an expansion team. Yeah. Another thing to keep in mind though, and I may have mentioned this on this program. If not, I mean, I don't remember. So you probably don't remember either, but I think we could see smaller stadiums in the future, which opens up smaller markets for NFL teams. And I say that because I know of some owners who who wonder whether or not it makes good financial sense to have an upper deck on their stadium. When you look at the revenue you get from that extra, I don't know how many thousand fit in the upper deck, 20, 30,000, the cost of having enough employees present to service the upper deck fans, how much money they spend relative to the money spent by the lower deck fans, I think that there's an argument to be made, or at least an analysis to be considered, as to whether it would be more profitable, as profitable, or almost as profitable to just dispense with the upper deck. So, boom, you could could build a 40,000-seat stadium in a small market. Now, it would be pricey, but you could fill it up, and you can make great return. And at the end of the day, what's it about now? What, What did we learn? When the NFL decided to flex Thursday night games late in the season, the in-stadium experience is taking a backseat to the ability to flood millions of homes with primetime NFL content. So as long as it feels full and it feels exciting, it doesn't matter whether it's 40, 50, 70, 100. It doesn't matter as long as it's full and it feels like it's a big deal. It could be 20,000. If you build it the right way and you do the camera angles the right way, it doesn't matter. As long as all the seats are filled, it's a big deal. That's the implicit message. That's why they had the blackout rule for so long. They wanted to have full stadiums on TV so it feels like a bigger deal. So you understand why you're watching it. You don't want to tune into a game and see all these empty seats and ask yourself, why am I watching this? If nobody bothers to go to this game, why am I sitting here watching this? That's what they want. And you can do that with smaller stadiums. So anyway, that got us away from the St. Louis question. Back to that, I think in time, the feathers will unruffle because the names will change of the people involved on both sides of the equation. David Mitchell, DRS Mitch, to D. Smith play any part in selecting his replacement? Seems he should be screaming the loudest that the process wasn't followed, but the process was followed. The question is, was it a good process? They engineered a process that I think is not good, but they followed it. They followed it. So I I think the reality is 
that in the aftermath of the 2020 CBA negotiations, which could have gone either way, which nearly resulted in the players rejecting the proposed agreement negotiated by DeMora Smith, that was essentially a vote of no confidence. And I think that's when the clock started ticking on him moving on. When you come that close to failure to ratify the CBA that you have proposed to the players, that's when it's time to start thinking about your next step in your career. Daniel Kunamoto, do you think the XFL or the USFL will be used by the Players Association as a bargaining tool? As in, we will strike the NFL and play over there if you don't give us what we want. Well, one problem is they don't play during football season. So it's not it's not exactly a great threat. They'll shut down the NFL season and then go play in the XFL or the USFL in the spring. Here's the bigger issue. And this is the true nuclear option that the union would have to balance the NFL nuclear option. The NFL nuclear option is players go out on strike and we hire replacements. We saw that in 1987. Player nuclear option is we go on strike or they lock us out and we start our own league and we do our own TV deal and we bring NFL players into your home. But that would take a ton of money to plan. It would require broadcast partners who are willing to forever burn their ability to consider doing business with the NFL for a possibility. Because there's, see, the greater that plan is put in place, the more it's ready to go. Where all you have to do is, is flip the switch. That makes it likely you're never going to have to use it. If they truly build the nuclear missile, they'll never have to use it. But you can't build the missile because the people who are involved in being your partners for broadcasting those games want the missile to fire. They're not going to forfeit their ability to potentially do business with the NFL to help you have a missile in your silo that just helps you continue to get your best possible deal with the NFL. So that would be the best way for the players to counter the full bargaining power of the league, but it's never going to happen. Let's see what else is here. I got to wrap this up. Burn unit, important question. Will there be a nice fatty ribeye fired up on your badass grill to celebrate the completion of your physical? I smoked a big ass cigar last night to celebrate the completion of my physical and I enjoyed it. And that leads to the question from local hero. Did you honestly tell your doctor how many drinks you have per week? Now I've had this conversation with my doctor. I drink in moderation and I smoke cigars in moderation as a way to deal with stress. I have Crohn's disease, and there are moments where it feels like there's an ice pick stuck in my descending colon. And frankly, I'm dealing with that currently. There's been some stress this week with the turnover of the site and the complaints, and I've been kind of at the center of the, of the storm of various different concerns and issues. And I won't bore you with the details, but it's been a stressful week. And when I'm under stress, it starts to it starts to manifest in pain in my colon where I have inflammatory bowel disease. I light up a cigar, it's gone. It's gone. Five minutes, it's gone. So my doctor knows that. My doctor knows I have a couple of drinks most nights. I rarely, if ever, get drunk. I rarely, if ever, even feel it. So he knows. And I went a long period of my life where I didn't drink at all. So I'm kind of using that as my, you know, I had like 25 years where I rarely drank. I didn't even want to. I got a lot of years where I never smoked a cigar. So as we coast into the golden years, and I know something's going to get me anyway, maybe the bear that's still roaming the hillside. Yeah, I'm very big on enjoying your life. And, and look, whatever you do, do it in moderation. I'll smoke a cigar every other day or every third day. And during football season, it's harder because I'll be on the road. And I don't feel like a compulsion. Like, like right now, I don't want to sit here and smoke a cigar while I do this. Not, and and I, I love that AJ Hawk does it on Pat McAfee's show, but I, I just don't have the desire to do it. I like going down to my bar. I like opening my laptop and writing some more fiction for novels, not for the usual stuff that I write on PFT, although some of you would say it's fiction. I like having a couple of drinks. I'll play a little golden tea and then I'll come back up to the house. That's what I like to do. That helps me get grounded after a, a long day of, 
of dealing with this job that I have. It really isn't a job, but it's felt like a job this week because we're still trying to make the best possible experience for you at PFT as we ensure that the new and improved PFT is truly improved. And there can be improvements to the improvements and we're trying to make it as good as it can be. A couple more real quick before we go. Let's see. King36, do you see any coach currently on the hot seat who might get fired midseason if they get off to a slow start? Well, there will be teams that get off to a slow start. And, yeah, there are teams where the coach is going into the year definitely on the hot seat. I think in Cleveland, Kevin Stefanski needs to be worried. He's not flaming hot seat, but if this Deshaun Watson thing ends up being a disaster, if they can't get anything positive out of Deshaun Watson by the middle of the season, he needs to be concerned. We have an owner there that we've seen fire a guy in the middle of the season. So we know that capacity exists. Chargers, if the Justin Herbert year four doesn't really work and they're losing in ugly fashion and they're one in six through seven games, yeah, that's a possibility for Brandon Staley to be gone midseason. There are several teams. If you really sit down and think about it, you know, at zero and zero, it's great. Once you start racking up those losses, then the pressure gets put on ownership. And then the question becomes, will ownership stand firm behind the coach or will they give in? Will we see what Jim Irsay did last year when Colts really weren't all that bad, but he just reached his, his limit. And I think he was determined to see what Jeff Saturday would do as an interim coach. So I think there are plenty of coaches. If things go sufficiently sideways right out of the gates, they could be worrying by the time Halloween rolls around. Fishman WVU, if Eric Bannemi has a good season with Washington on his own, do you think he'll be a good head coaching candidate next year? Or has he been blackballed for some reason? I think that he took the job in Washington because he recognized that if he's ever going to have a chance to be an NFL head coach, he needs to go to a team without an Andy Reid as the head coach. And he picked a team with a defensive head coach. He needs to go there. He needs to run the offense well. That's the only way he's ever going to stand out. And we'll know. If the offense goes well in Washington and he doesn't get a head coaching job, that's when we say something else is going on here. Because no longer can anyone say, well, it's all Andy Reid. Now, never mind the fact that Doug Peterson was in that same job and became a head coach with two different teams. Matt Nagy was in that job and became head coach of the Bears and was coach of the year's first season in Chicago. All of a sudden, that pipeline ended with Eric Bieniem. If he goes to Washington... And that offense is great with Sam Howell at quarterback or Jacoby Brissett, if it turns out being Brissett. And the enemy doesn't get a head coaching job. Something fishy is going on. All right, let's see what else we have here. One more from Tom. If Brian Flores didn't have big plans for da uh, Daniel Hunter being in his defense, do you believe Hunter would have been traded by now? What would the Vikings defense look like if their best pass rusher were to be traded? Well, they've already traded Zadarius Smith, who had double digit sacks last year. And Hunter did as well. And my argument's been defense isn't going to be any worse without Daniel Hunter or any of the players from last year. Brian Flores alone is going to make the defense better than it was last year. The scheme was bad last year. The question is, can they make Daniel Hunter happy with his $5.5 million compensation package? He wants more. So I don't think it's about trading him. It's about paying him. Are they going to pay him? Do they see the necessity in paying him? Is their attitude, hey, you play for us, you play for no one. We'll play hardball with you. If you're not happy with your contract, sit out. But you're going to be fined. And you're not going to get any closer to free agency if you sit out the whole year. So... I feel like the Vikings have been patient where they can be. They were ready to move on from Dalvin Cook. They were patient. They were ready to move on from Zadarius Smith. They were patient. Being patient with Daniel Hunter. Maybe they will eventually trade him. And maybe they'll just wait for an injury to a pass rusher with another team to open up a trade market for Daniel Hunter. We'll see how it plays out. All right, that's it for today. Went over an hour, but I uh, wanted to make up a little bit for yesterday. Missing. PFTPM, we're 9 out of 10. That's a 90. Is that still an A somewhere? I don't know. We'll be back Monday, I think, unless it's a company holiday. Tuesday is the 4th of July. We won't do it then. Definitely by Wednesday. Definitely on Wednesday. Definitely. 
Wednesday for PFTPM. But absolutely, without question, around the clock at ProFootballTalk.com. Thanks, as always, for some of your time. We'll see you again here real soon. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.